Hi, everyone. Welcome to Weekly Insights. There's a growing claim out there, sometimes in academic writing, but more often in online commentary, that narcissistic personality disorder, or NPD, is almost entirely genetic. Some recent authors have even suggested heritability rates as high as 80%. So today I want to take a closer look at that claim, not to deny that genes play some role in personality development, but to question what it really means when we say that a condition is genetic, and whether that claim holds up when applied to NPD. So let's begin with the most generous reading of this view. Narcissistic traits, like many personality traits, do show some degree of heritability. Twin studies have found moderate genetic contributions to traits like antagonism, impulsivity, extroversion, and low agreeableness, and these are traits that are sometimes considered proximal to narcissistic functioning. For example, a 2014 twin study in PLOS One found that grandiosity had a heritability of about 23% and entitlement of about 35%. To be fair, this figure is not insignificant, but it falls well short of genetic determinism. There are also findings from research using the five-factor model showing that narcissism correlates with high extroversion and low agreeableness, both of which show moderate heritability. But inheriting a tendency toward boldness or antagonism isn't the same thing as developing a personality disorder. The presence of a trait is not equivalent to the presence of a syndrome. Unfortunately, this modest heritability is sometimes extrapolated into sweeping deterministic claims, and more troublingly, these claims are often made without a full understanding of what NPD actually is, its essential features, its complexity, and how it's accurately assessed. One of the most common arguments used to support the idea of a primarily genetic origin is brain imaging. Some studies have found differences in brain structure and function in individuals with narcissistic traits, especially in the prefrontal cortex and the anterior insula. These regions are involved in empathy, emotion regulation, and self-awareness. For example, a 2013 study published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research found reduced gray matter volume in the left anterior insula in individuals diagnosed with NPD. But here we need to pause. The existence of neural differences doesn't tell us why those differences exist, only that they do. There's an assumption that if something appears on a brain scan, it must be genetically caused, but that's not actually how neurodevelopment works. The brain is exquisitely plastic. It's shaped as much by experience as by inherited structure. Neurons that fire together, wire together, is a central principle of experience-dependent plasticity. When emotional expression is met with rejection or indifference, or when vulnerability is punished rather than comforted, the child adapts. And those adaptations become neural patterns. Defensive postures like emotional constriction, vigilance, or performative self-presentation shape the developing brain. And over time, they will show up in imaging studies. But that doesn't mean that they started there. In fact, a 2023 study found that emotional neglect was correlated with structural changes in brain regions that are critical for social cognition and empathy, notably the anterior insula, the very same region implicated in empathy deficits among individuals with narcissistic features. These neural alterations highlight the impact of early emotional neglect on the development of brain areas that are essential for emotional awareness and interpersonal understanding. And we have growing empirical support for the importance of early relational experience in the development of narcissistic traits. For example, Otway and Vignoli's in 2006 found that both emotional coldness and excessive parental overvaluation predicted higher narcissism scores in adulthood. Horton and colleagues, also in 2006, similarly found that low parental warmth combined with unrealistic or inflated praise was associated with later narcissistic traits, and a 2015 longitudinal study demonstrated that parental overvaluation, that is, treating children as inherently more special or entitled than others, significantly predicted the emergence of narcissistic traits over time. These findings are consistent with the long-standing clinical understanding that narcissistic pathology develops through a complex interplay of constitutional vulnerability and early relational failures 
not through genetic transmission alone. So while it's true that individuals with narcissistic traits show differences in brain regions that are associated with things like empathy or self-awareness, to suggest that these are genetic causes rather than developmental consequences is a leap that simply isn't justified by the evidence. The deeper problem with these genetic arguments is that they often begin from a distorted view of what NPD actually is. Too often, NPD is reduced to traits like arrogance, entitlement, or lack of empathy. And if that's all there was, then sure, it might be easier to argue for a neurobiological substrate. But that's not what NPD is. For example, numerous studies of narcissism are still using the Narcissistic Personality Inventory, or NPI, as their main indicator of pathological narcissism. The problem here, as I've discussed in previous videos, is that the NPI doesn't measure pathological narcissism. It largely measures disagreeable but adaptive traits, like extroversion, confidence, and socially aggressive behaviors. And these aren't NPD. They fall well short of capturing anything specific to NPD. Even a cursory search through recent articles brought up a study from 2021 that correlated high NPI scores with differences in prefrontal brain structure, drawing erroneous conclusions in the process. NPD is a deeply conflicted, internally unstable condition. The diagnosis itself has long been controversial, in fact, it was nearly eliminated from the DSM-5 in 2013 due to poor empirical grounding, low inter-rater reliability, and limited clinical utility. It remains one of the least reliably diagnosed personality disorders in the manual. The DSM criteria prioritize overt traits like grandiosity, fantasies of success, and need for admiration, while largely ignoring the vulnerable core that has been extensively documented in the clinical literature. NPD isn't arrogance, or confidence, or even low empathy, and studies that isolate those traits and then call them, quote, narcissism, are incomplete at best and misleading at worst. The vulnerable core of NPD is vital to understanding and accurately identifying the disorder. It includes chronic shame, unstable self-esteem, social withdrawal, depression, and even suicidality. People with narcissistic personality pathology often feel like imposters in their own lives, and this is where the genetic narrative begins to fall apart. Because are we really to believe that a specific genetic combination reliably produces both crushing self-doubt and highly complex compensatory defenses? Both low self-worth and the grandiose systems that prop it up? That's not how genetics works. It's certainly not how personality development works. For decades, psychodynamic clinicians have described early environments commonly seen in people with narcissistic pathology. Homes where emotional attunement was inconsistent or absent, where achievement was rewarded more than presence, where normal needs for care, validation, and vulnerability were treated as shameful or weak. Heinz Kohut called this the failure of empathic mirroring. Otto Kernberg wrote of parental figures who were themselves fragile, punitive, or emotionally unavailable, and James Masterson described the conflict between the real self and the false self in the narcissistic personality. In all of these formulations, narcissism is not a trait. Rather, it's a defensive solution, a way of maintaining psychic cohesion in the absence of adequate relational support. And in my own clinical experience, with over a decade of specializing in pathological narcissism and NPD, I have never encountered someone with a full syndrome presentation of NPD who did not describe significant emotional neglect or relational trauma. Not one. That's anecdotal, of course. But it is anecdotally consistent with nearly every clinical theory of narcissistic development that we have. So let's compare this now with something like Alzheimer's disease. We don't have all the pieces, but we do understand Alzheimer's to be a biologically based condition. We've identified genetic markers like the ApoE4 gene that reliably increase risk. We can image the brain. We know the course of progression, and we can reliably and verifiably diagnose it. And yet, even with all that, our best estimate for heritability is only about 40 to 50%. The rest 
comes from environment, things like lifestyle, vascular health, inflammation, and diet. So how do we get from 40% heritability in a medically defined biomarker-supported condition like Alzheimer's to 80% heritability in a poorly defined, non-biological, socially shaped syndrome like NPD? Where are the genes? Where's the imaging evidence? Where's the consensus? It's simply not there. It sounds authoritative to say that something is genetic, but it's often used to shut down inquiry rather than promote it. It flattens complexity. It lets us ignore context. It lets us say, well, this is just how they are. They were born that way. But that's not what the science says. Genes matter, temperament matters, but narcissistic personality pathology emerges from an ongoing recursive relational process. It's shaped by how we're met in our vulnerability when we're young, how we're seen or not seen, how we're loved or not loved. To suggest that NPD is almost entirely genetic is to ignore the heart of the disorder and to invalidate the very real suffering that people with NPD have experienced, the tragic neglect, abuse, and trauma that contributes substantially to its development. I won't claim to understand why people feel so motivated to adopt the stance that NPD is almost entirely genetic. Maybe it's just a simple answer to a complex question and people find that easier to swallow. But the real answer is that we simply don't know. We can't identify genetic markers, brain pathways, or neurochemical imbalances for most forms of mental illness. We simply don't understand the brain as well as we'd like. And I think lots of people are frightened by that ambiguity. But when we're faced with not knowing, we shouldn't respond by making up comforting answers. Someday, we might develop a coherent, brain-based model for mental illnesses like NPD. But that day remains somewhere in the future. Okay, so that's it for today. As always, leave questions or comments below. And if you like this video and you'd like to receive more like it on a weekly basis, consider becoming a paid member of the channel. Your support helps me to make more content more often. Until next time, take good care.